welcome to the Institute of Psychiatry. So the organizers decided to take you to the oldest part of the Institute. So this, and, and so this is the old and rather decrepit uh, Wolfson Lecture Theatre. Most of the rest of the Institute is rather better. And they also decided that you would have a talk from the oldest professor. So you have, <laughs> you have me for about half an hour. And I guess you all know that the Institute is part of King's College. King's College is very proud of itself just now because it did rather well in the Sunday Times rating for last year. I don't know about when the ratings for this year come out, but it, it did very well. And here in, in King's there are nine different institutions or, or schools, faculties, and the Institute is one of them. And here, here's the picture of the front of the Institute. Can I just understand a, what, you all have expressed an interest in coming to the, to the Institute and some people have actually signed on the dotted line or not, or not yet. So, so some, people have, so, have, some people have already signed up? How many people? Put, put, okay, so it's hardly worth me giving a talk then. <laughs> So it can only get worse. I can only put, I can only, uh, can only put you off by <coughs> a regression to the mean. So, uh, so just to say a little bit about the different parts of the Institute. So one of the big areas of the Institute research is into genetics research. And there's a big building at the back called the SGDP building. Has anybody been there? It's, a, it's our nicest building, I think. I, I think I wish I worked there. Uh, and so they, are, they have been interested in the genetics in relation to personality and psychiatric disorder, but more particularly in relation to the environment and gene-environment interactions, because there are, for behaviour, there are no big genes. You know, every so often, a few years ago, you would read that there was a single gene for intelligence or a single gene for being gay or a single gene for this and that, and they never turned out to... Actually, there is actually a gene for preventing people sitting in the front row of lecture theatres. <laughs> 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 but the, uh, what, the, what the Institute and the SGDP in particular have been interested in is gene-environment interaction. And actually this chap is Avshalom Kaspi, and in 2002 he published what has become the most widely cited a psychiatric paper in the last 10 years, which was an interaction between adverse life events and a particular serotonin gene, the serotonin transporter promoter, because lots of people have adverse life events. I guess everybody has adverse life events of one degree or another, but only a proportion of people will break down. And what they showed was that there was an interaction, so that those who had a particular allele, a, of the serotonin a transporter promoter were much more likely to, to get depressed following a, a, an adverse life event. And then subsequently other people here have gone on to show that another serotonin gene is a predictive of who responds to a particular antidepressants. So there has been a lot of interest in, the, in this question of are there genes? There are no genes really for, well, are, are there genes for eating disorder? Okay, no, no. But there are genes that might interact with your environment in order to, in order to increase your risks. So I guess gene-environment interaction is one of the, 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 the really big, big areas. And, uh, and this, the first real gene-environment interaction studied by uh, Avshalom Kaspi and Temi Offit has promote, promoted a whole series of papers looking at this question. The, 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 this question. Another area is brain imaging. So when I was little, the brain was very dull and gray, but the brain became colored and much, much, more, much more interesting with the development of fMRI and a structural imaging, functional imaging, then PET scanning, and the ability to look not only at the structure and function, but also at the, the, the receptors and look at the neurochemistry. So there's, I guess, the, the possibility of, of uh, learning more about genes and, uh, and, and also imaging. I guess everybody knows that 
Everybody here is doing, going to do an MSc. No, are there people who are, who are exclusively going to do a PhD? No, so this is all MSE people, people you might progress and, and, and go on to do, to do a, a PhD. But most of the MSCs you have to do a particular project or a, or a, a, a little dissertation or, or thesis. So the question, you then have the opportunity to sort of decide which particular area you would like to do research. And you can do biological research, such as uh, genetics or imaging, or you can do a, the more psych psychosocial research. I show this uh, slide because the, one of the area I'm most interested in is, is schizophrenia. And we found that one of the differences between people with severe schizophrenia and the rest of us is in terms of brain development during adolescence. So we tend to think the brain is sort of is fully developed, but just a bit smaller when you know somebody is 12. But there are a lot of a lot of uh, changes in the brain and in synapses uh, during adolescence, and it seems that this is the period when things go wrong, uh, particularly in early onset schizophrenia. This is a very interesting research into virtual reality. So. This is a virtual reality probe of being in the tube, obviously. And the tube is a paranoia inducing experience, isn't it? So you, when you're sitting in the tube, you're sitting here and you're looking at someone and being, most of you being English will not know where to look. Uh, do you look straight at the other person? You look straight at the other person. They look back. Bloody hell! What do you do then? Do you, do, you, do, you, do you look away? And why are they looking at you? Is there something? Oh, the ladies, I guess, say, is there something wrong with my makeup? And uh, so, what say, one of our colleagues did was to set up a, a virtual reality a, a room, and you go in and you wear the goggles, and you think you're actually in the tube, or, or you, you walk in, and just as you walk in, one of these. Uh, uh, <coughs> these uh, simulated people burst out laughing or starts talking to somebody else and or smiles and some people react is very amazing some people react uh, to a glance uh, that say oh and they say oh that person thinks I'm handsome or that pe person thinks I'm very attractive and other people say why is he looking at me he's, he, he's really against me he thinks there's something wrong with me with the same exactly the same uh, a visual experience. And so this is a, a measure of, a, a, of paranoia. So you can do this on, it used to be thought that psychotic people are categorically different from the rest of us, that there were 98% of us were sane and 2% were psychotic. But now we know there's a sort of distribution and some people are more prone to paranoia and other people are less prone to paranoia. You can, you can assess this by questions but it's much better actually to put people in a situation where they get just a little bit stressed. And then you can, you can see their reaction in a situation of, of social anxiety. So there's, there, another type of uh, interesting research is that pa our patients do research, but they, they, they're actually called service users. That's a sort of a, 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 a correct, correct term, I guess. But uh, this, is, this started about 10 years ago, and I think we were initially a little bit skeptical uh, because doctors assume that they will do the research and patients will be the recipients of it. But actually the service user research has been very interesting. For example, some of you will know about electroconvulsive therapy, which is a, a rather old fashioned uh, treatment, mostly, mostly decreasing, but still with some, some very uh, limited use in certain aspects. But one of the aspects about, of it has always been, does it induce impairment of memory? And when psychologists do the tests on people who have had ECT, they always find that they've, they've performed absolutely normally. And they say there is, no, there is no adverse consequence of having ECT. But patients often complain they cannot remember events in their life. But psychologists had never really properly studied this. So, so what the service user did was they did the usual neuropsychological tests and people who had, had ECT and people who hadn't had ECT and showed no difference. But they, did, they looked at autobiographical memory. And this is where the difficulties were. The patient, pa patients who'd had ECT couldn't remember uh, you know, some important event. Uh, 
they, they couldn't rem remember somebody dying or a particular ex expedition or they, they had difficulty remembering about the day of their wedding and, and things like that. So it was particularly the autobiographical memory and it was really the patients who had the sense to look at this rather than, rather than the, the professionals. So that's been a, 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 a very interesting area of research. Anybody been to the Maudsley Hospital? So, so, I, so the Maudsley is our associated hos ho hospital, but is now part of a bigger I, I trust I called the South London Maudsley Trust for which there are, or I don't, how many different hospitals does it, do, do, you, do you know, do you know Kate? Or do you, do you know? Five, five boroughs, yes. So, so it, co it covers about 1.2 million uh, <coughs> people. So if, if, you, if, you get, if, you get to, if you go psychotic on a bus in South London, you're quite likely to come to the, to the, to the, the Mosley Hospital or some other uh, associated hospital. So we look after psychiatry at the Maudsley and at St Thomas's and Guy's and in Brixton and in Lewisham and, and, and so on. I guess it's mostly... I, I, you probably wouldn't be coming here if you wanted to be interested in the psychiatric care of billionaires. There are not too many of these in, in South London. So we, the great thing about this is you have the opportunity to work in a rather deprived uh, community, but one with l people from all, uh, from all across the world. And I, I guess to some extent the Institute's a bit like that, uh, that uh, the, 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 we have students from all over the world, our staff are from all over the world, and our patients also. Out of interest, how many are na here are native English? So about, about, about a third, a third, yeah, some, some, something like that. At one time, I had an, an ambition to have no English people in my department, <laughs> but I never quite achieved, achieved this. No, that's just not. But certainly, it's one of the great things of being here. There, there are people from all, <coughs> all across the world. So there is a, a cl close relationship between the Institute and the Maudsley, and many of you will have the opportunity to go and, and work with patients or do, little, do studies with, with pa patients in the Maudsley or one of the other associated hospitals. I thought I would say just a little bit about some of the, the, the research which I think has been interesting. And this is, this is a study, this is a, 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 a man who was, say, I, I came here in the, in the 1970s and I had been here for about six years before I discovered this man who was interested in nicotine dependence. And in, in psychiatry, usually we think of the most interesting disorders as schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or one of these conditions, but he worked away quietly on cigarette smoking. And he was the first person to suggest that cigarette smoking was, just, was not a habit. I mean, it's remarkable. Uh, that uh, now we know that it's a, an addiction, but in, uh, uh, you can see on the bottom here in 1971, he suggested that a cigarette smoking was, was a dependence and said it requires no more than three or four uh, casual cigarettes during adolescence to ensure that a person will eventually become a regular dependent smoker. And said nicotine is the reinforcing agent. And uh, this was revolutionary. It is very curious to think when one goes back to that, that there were discussions as to why people smoked till it was something to do with their hands and uh, something to keep them occupied and uh, so on. But nobody discussed nicotine until along came a Mike, Mike Russell. And of course now you can see that we have this image of, of heavy dependence. This was a, I think this was a, a public health poster that was put out about two years ago and rapidly withdrawn because it was thought to be too, too, too horrible, I think. But it shows how the, 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 the pool of, of nicotine. And the other thing I wanted to mention was that he developed the first nicotine chewing gum. So this is the first paper in 1976 on nicotine chewing gum. And of course, now you know that it's a, an, an amazing, huge industry. It, in fact, has an in, is an industry with an annual turnover of $900 million. A, a, a dollars. And he was a wonderful person and a wonderful researcher, Mike Russell. He had one severe deficiency 
he did not patent this nicotine chewing gum. So unfortunately, nine, none of this 900 million pounds uh, comes to the, the Institute of Psychiatry or the, or the uh, MRC who funded them. People didn't do that in these days. Nowadays, you would be phoning, you would be phoning up your, your patent lawyer to, 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 to get it organized. So we, have, we can talk a lot about I'm very happy to answer questions and talk a lot about, uh, about different aspects of the Institute. But I was also asked to talk a little bit about my research and uh, one of the areas that I'm interested in. So I'm interested in the causes of schizophrenia. And one possible cause is cannabis. And you will know, of course, that most people who smoke cannabis have no problems and get on very well. In fact, when was the last president of the United States who had not smoked cannabis? It was George Bush Sr. At least he doesn't admit that he took cannabis because uh, Bill Clinton, did he smoke cannabis? He did not inhale, <laughs> uh, he said. Like he, had, he did not have sex with Monica. He, did, he, he, he said he had been given cannabis, but he did not inhale. George Bush smoked lots of cannabis and took lots of, alco lots of alcohol and a bit of cocaine. And then, very unfortunately, he met a wonderful lady who straightened about, much to the detriment of the world. <laughs> Excuse me. And then here is Barack Obama. Obama, who what used to be an enthusiastic uh, cannabis smoker, and in fact was, a legal, was in favor of legalization of cannabis until he started running for president, and now he's against it. So uh, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that uh, really the vast majority of people that, that smoke cannabis come to no harm. That uh, the most famous cannabis user, I guess, was Bob Marley, never had any problems with the cannabis. Uh, Paul McCartney has uh, smoked cannabis every day since he was a beetle. Has he come to any harm? Some people say he was stoned when he proposed to his second wife. But, <laughs> but uh, other than that, <coughs> he's obviously not had any problems. So it's just like alcohol. The vast majority of people that drink come to no harm. Even people who drink heavily come to no harm. And it's a bit similar with, with cannabis. But equally for alcohol, a, a small proportion Become, become dependent, develop alcoholism, have all sorts of physical problems. And for cannabis, a small proportion go psychotic. And uh, this is a study that we did in, in New Zealand, actually, and uh, in Dunedin. And this was a cohort of children who were seen lots of times by psychologists and nurses and psychiatrists in early adult life, a representative co cohort. And uh, so they were seen 10 times in childhood and then they were interviewed at 15 and 18 and at that point they were asked whether they had taken any cannabis and then they were followed up to age 26 and then to 32 and now to 42 and 96% of them have been followed up. New Zealand is just a little place and it's not possible to escape from psychiatric researchers who can hunt, <laughs> hunt you down. And you can see that this is the odds ratio. So people who started smoking cannabis by 18 were 1.6 times more likely to be psychotic by 20, 20, 26. It wasn't significant. But people who started smoking by 15 were four and a half times more likely to be psychotic by, uh, by, by <coughs> 26. So then a whole lot of other studies have come out showing something similar. So down the left are the countries then the number, how long they were followed up, and then the odds ratio of being psychotic. If you were a ca if you'd taken cannabis versus not taken cannabis, for example, the Swedish study along the top, 50,000 young men followed up for 25 years. Those who had smoked cannabis were twice as likely to go psychotic as those who hadn't. Those who smoked heavily were about four times more likely to, to, go, to, go, to go psychotic. And all these studies showed much the same thing. But if you were a skeptic, what would you say? What other explanations could this be other than it's the cannabis that increases the risk? Environment, environment factors. Such as? Uh, migration. 
Well, so it would have to be migration which was associated with cannabis smoking. Because so we have an association between cannabis smoking and later risk of schizophrenia. But what you're saying, I guess, is maybe a particular group of, maybe migrants in general are more likely to smoke than, than the native British. But is that true? Is it seen as irregular in South London? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I mean, you are correct. It actually, we looked at migrants to see whether migrants, uh, migrants don't smoke more than, than native British. And then we looked at uh, black migrants, and black migrants weren't more likely to smoke uh, cannabis than the native British. But, of course, we stupidly didn't split migrants, in, black migrants, into where they came from, and actually, you're correct that people from the Caribbean do smoke a little bit more than, than, <coughs> than uh, nat native English, but people from Africa smoke less. So they sort of ba they, they, they balanced out. So, so it, 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 it's not migration. Any other, any other explanations? Yeah? Sorry? So you could have genes which made you more likely to smoke cannabis and also more likely to go psychotic. It is true, you could. We looked at that and uh, we, we didn't, so people with a family history of psychosis are not more likely to, to smoke cannabis. We looked at uh, we, the genes that we know for psychosis, we looked at them, we didn't, we didn't find that. Anything else? Another, oh, yeah. Maybe psychotic people like to smoke cannabis. Yes, well that, that so, so certainly if you, go, if you go across to the Maudsley and you talk to a hundred psychotic patients, you will find that something like 70% are current cannabis smokers, whereas the general population rate around here is about 30%. So there's no doubt that psychotic people smoke more, but that, obviously, as you point out, you can't say whether they smoke more because they're psychotic or whether, they, whether the cannabis causes them to go psychosis. But these are actually studies of people, healthy people, then followed up. You know, like these studies of lung cancer, does smoking cause lung cancer? So you take normal people and follow them up for 25 years and see whether the smokers are more likely to develop a lung cancer. So this is, this is prospective. So in this, this instance, it, 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 that, 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 is, that is, is not an explanation. So other explanations could be... Well, that would yes, that would certainly increase that at the risk, and we can come to that. But of course, the, the one question was: Do do cannabis users? Actually, there's a, a question related to what you said. Is it possible that people who are going to go psychotic might have some symptoms, like anxiety and a bit of paranoia, for which they might take take, take cannabis? And we excluded that. Also, it could be that cannabis users are more likely to to use amphetamine and cocaine, which we know for sure can increase the risk of psychosis. And that does have an effect. It decreases the effect a little bit. But most of the, we, we, we've tried very hard with all of these uh, things and it, it doesn't go away. So it does seem that there, is, that, there is an increase, that there is an increased risk. But it's not, I mean, this is not a huge risk. Most studies are saying about a doubling or if you're a heavy cannabis user, maybe about four, four times. But if you're a heavy smoker, you're like 20 times more likely to get lung cancer. So, on the, qu the question you raised of, of, uh, of, of what kind of cannabis. So here is a hash or, or resin. Here is imported ca herbal cannabis or weed. You can see that in Camberwell area, dealers are very generous. That as well as getting your cannabis, you get a free ballpoint pen. <laughs> <laughs> But it's just to show you the size. But of course, uh, sinsamila or skunk is, is, uh, is, is now much more common than, than, than it used to be. And of course, there are, the newspapers run stories that this is 10 times more uh, potent and so on. It's not 10 times more important, potent, but it, THC tetrahydrocannabinol is the crucial ingredient of cannabis. And this is the, this is the concentration in resin which is a, it runs about five, four, five, six percent, hasn't changed much. This is the concentration 
herbal, ca herbal cannabis, which isn't, so, isn't used so much around here. And this is the concentration in Sintamila or skunk, which is round, running around about 16% here. So one question has been, does it make any difference? Uh, what, what, you, what you smoke? Uh, and uh, we, we have, uh, actually, if you come, if you come, well, you, most of you are going to come as an MSc, you have the opportunity to, to be a subject in lots of studies. In fact, some people make a living out of this, that you, get, you can get 20 pounds for this or 40 pounds for that and so on. And so we have advertised for people to take intravenous tetrahydrocannabinol or the major ingredient of cannabis. Usually it's quite difficult to get volunteers, but not for, not for, in, for intravenous THC. So we got lots of volunteers. And this is Paul Morrison, who uh, uh, gave people, so they either got intravenous THC or they got a pl intravenous placebo. And they didn't know which they were getting. You can see, and up the side is a score of psychoticism. psychoticism. Are you, do you hear voices? Do you think uh, uh, people are, are you feeling suspicious? Are people against you? The sort of usual psychotic uh, questions. And you can see that the people who got the THC showed an increase in the, in the PAN score, and then it gradually declined uh, over a, a, a couple of hours. People ranged. Some people say, just said, oh, I must have got the placebo when they'd actually had the THC. Some other people went quite psychotic and a couple of people had to be given uh, benzodiazepines to uh, Valium type things to, 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 to ca ca calm down. So it's the THC and it's the strength of the THC that is the critical thing. And so we've been uh, looking to see whether our patients are particularly likely to take what, what is the risk associated with this? Is it, is it hash? Is it, uh, <coughs> is it imported herbal cannabis or is, it, or is it skunk? So this is a study of 258 patients in their first episode of psychosis, 220 healthy controls. This is uh, reported by Marta de Forti, who is in charge of this particular study. And this is the risk of psychosis. Starting at the bottom, no use. Hash, uh, less than weekly, sort of just about doubles. Hash at weekends, uh, increases further. Skunk, less than weekly, and skunk up, up, up to skunk daily. So you can see that there is a, a, a steady increase in, 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 in risk uh, with each of, of these units. So it's a, bit, it's a bit like, again, it's a bit like alcohol. If you think of, uh, of old-fashioned cannabis as a bit like lager, I mean, it's possible to become an alcohol addict on uh, uh, drinking lager, but it's quite hard. It's much easier with vodka. And I guess you can think of the same in relation to cannabis, that, it, that the risk with occasional use of cannabis is very, very low, insignificant. Uh, but uh, the risk for those people taking skunk every day is getting up to... Uh, a, an odds ratio of about, about eight. As I said, for, for lung cancer, the odds ratio would be, with cigarette smoking, would be about, would be about, about a 20, 20 fold. So it does seem that there is a risk. So that, I guess that's, that's about where we stand. So what do you think we should, what kind of research should we do next? If you, if, a, or should we ban cannabis? Or should, what, what uh, what should we do? What should we do with these data? Uh, sorry, I can't hear you. Yes. So, what what do you think might be the risks? The, what fa what factors might increase the risk? So, but if socioeconomic status being rich would be good or bad? Well, I imagine it would be somewhat worse for the individual. Uh, simply, simply because they might not affect the age at which one might begin. Ah, so, so public schools would be bad. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, a, it, 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 it might, yes. We actually haven't found a big, a big social class a 
a, a, a divide. One thing that is quite, is quite interesting is that our, in the general population, cannabis smokers are not more intelligent than non cannabis smokers. They're just about the same. But amongst people with psychosis, cannabis users are more intelligent than other people with psychosis. And this puzzled us a lot at first, but quite a lot of people who have psychosis have developmental problems. And if you look at the IQ of children who develop psychosis, it's about 95 rather than 100. So because there, if things like obstetric events or having meningitis as a child, things that, that slightly mess up the development of your brain would increase your risk of psychosis. So there are a lot of people who develop psychosis because of these developmental problems, but the people who are drug users, they are, in order to get to the drug dealer by 13, you have to be really smart and you really have to be sociable. You've got to have mates and you've got to be able to con the money out of your mum and dad. So these are street smart kids uh, in comparison with other people who develop schizophrenia who, uh, who are, are, are much less able to actually get out and, and be sociable enough to, to take drugs or take, to take a lot of drugs. So, but other factors, would, so people who are a bit paranoid I, I, are more likely to have problems and people who had a family history. And uh, we got very excited because we found a gene called a COMPT gene, a catecholomethyltransferase, and a particular allele of that seemed to increase the likelihood of, uh, of, of, of going psychotic. And so we thought that we could go to pop festivals and set up a little tent. And as people were, ca were, were coming in, we would be, I would be there shouting out genotyping, genotyping over here. And people would come along and give a thumb prick. And we would say, come back in an hour and we'll tell you your genotype and whether you can smoke cannabis or not. And after an hour, they could come back and we would say, oh, it's fine, no problems. You can get stoned all weekend. There's no difficulty. <laughs> And somebody else, oh, you have the Val-Val genotype. You should not smoke any cannabis. You just have to stick to heroin. There is <laughs> that, uh, so uh, so uh, 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 there's been some difficulty replicating this. Some people have replicated and other people haven't replicated. But I suppose ultimately one will find that different people will react to different, different uh, substances, both legal and Ill Ill illegal differentially. But at, at present... You know, deans are very, university are very keen to make money. So when I chatted to the dean about this possibility of making money, it was quite interesting. But, <laughs> but it, so, so that's one of the things we're, we're, we're doing. The other thing we're, trying, we're looking at in cannabis, there's also a stuff called can cannabidiol, CBD, which seems to be protective. And, uh, and so it, if you have a lot of CBD in your cannabis, this seems to make you more sort of chill out and, 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 and uh, not, be so, not be so prone to developing any adverse uh, reactions. What do you think we should do with this knowledge? Educate. Educate people. What, should, what, should, what would the message be? Get Sorry? Yeah, but we don't have a proper test yet. We can't say that. No, we, we could say hang about till and get tested in the future. Be careful. Yes, probably. What should the politicians do? The one thing you can say is that cannabis is extremely bad for the brains of politicians. They do not know what to do. Because <laughs> sometimes they get attacked for being too lenient and then they liberalise, like the Labour government, they liberalise that, and then the, then the very papers that have encouraged them to do that turn on them and attack them for being too, uh, too liberal, and then, they, then they, they go back and they make it... A, what, 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 a, what is the class, what classification of drug is cannabis? Is it A, B or C? B. Are you sure? C. C? Do you think it matters? <coughs> yes. I th you see, along down Cold Harbour Lane, there are there are fourteen-year-old boys saying, "Is that a C or a B drugs? Will I will I smoke it or not?" <laughs> and nobody cares. I, but so but as, but I think just the knowledge that that uh, that it is it is not sensible to just as well, just as it's not sensible to drink a bottle of vodka a day, it's not sensible to have six joints a day. I can I can tell you that. Uh, 
that when we started doing this, in, this research, an institute professor said, I've been, taking, I've been smoking every day for the last 11 years. And this is a very bright, uh, sensible person, smoking old-fashioned uh, uh, cannabis, I should say, though. So what, uh, what else do you think we might do? So, one, so, so I guess I, uh, w w w one, one, one of the areas is this que the, the, the question of the different constituents of cannabis, because it's not just that there are there's THC and CBD, but lots of other uh, types as well. Anyway, I'm, I'm talking about my, I, my own research say, for too long. Are, are there other questions people would like to ask about the Institute in general? Other people do some research as well. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>